If you were to visit a post office in 1925, you would probably be greeted by the local postmaster or postmistress. But how did one get to be the postmaster? Connections, that's how. This position was an essential one in any community, but it was also strictly the product of political patronage. The postmaster general appointed each local postmaster at the recommendation of the congressman from that district. The congressman curried political favor with influential local citizens by making the recommendation, while the postmaster general curried favor with each member of Congress by following the recommendation. And why was it such a big deal to be appointed postmaster? Well, the postmaster got to keep the profits from the business of the mail. Mailbox rentals, stamp purchases, and other services all reaped financial benefits to the postmaster. In small areas, the profits were not much. But in large cities, postmasters could become quite wealthy from the appointment. The influence of political patronage and the appointment of local postmasters did not end in the United States until the Postal Reorganization Act of 1970. When you went into the 1925 post office to retrieve your mail, you might wonder how it got there from far away. By 1925, the primary method of long-distance postal transportation was the railroad. However, one additional major feature of mail delivery in 1925 was the widespread growth of airplanes as a significant transportation means. The Air Mail Act of 1925 provided government contracts to private companies to use airplanes to carry mail across the country. Officially, air transport of the mail had been taking place since 1918, but the Air Mail Act of 1925 made this form of transportation a permanent feature in mail delivery. Automobile maker Henry Ford was one of the first Americans to profit from carrying mail and cargo via air. He won two air mail contracts in 1925 using his company's Ford Trimotor aircraft. 